3 for 3 is produced by Impact Networking, hosted at the state-of-the-art Unified Support Operations Center in Lake Forest, Illinois. To find out more about the company, schedule a tour of our facilities, or speak to a representative, visit us on the web at impactmybiz.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Dick Stockton, and welcome to 3 for 3, an inside look into the careers of icons from many walks of life who have made history, they've broken down barriers, and they continue to bring change in their community. I'm joined today by Bill Jacobs, Impact Networking's Chief Diversity Officer, and our very special guest, Jesse White, who is the Secretary of State of the State of Illinois, He's held that post since 1999. He's the first African-American to hold that position and the longest serving in that role by far. Uh, Jesse, good to have you with us. Politics have dominated your life. I want you to, I want to ask you, going way back to your youth, what turned you into the fact that you have held this post for as long as you have? Well, I uh I was played professional baseball in the Cub organization. Well, let me go back to my high school days. I'll back to Alton, Illinois, where I was born. At age seven, we moved to Chicago, and we moved into an Italian neighborhood where Cabrini Green was at one time. And I attended the Shell Elementary School, and I went back to teach there for about 20 years. And then Lincoln Park, which is now, which was Waller High School then, and then Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Dr. King was my minister when I was a student. And uh, then after I had completed my education, uh, I went out to Wrigley Field to try it out with the Cubs. And as it turned out, uh, there were about 300 ball players trying out and they selected five and I was one of the five. And so I was scheduled to go to spring training in March of 57. But as it turned out, I was drafted into the Army. And they sent me to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And while I was there, uh, I decided I wanted to learn how to jump out of airplanes. And so I was transferred to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, became a part of the 101st Airborne Division, did 35 jumps, came back to Chicago. And then I got involved in the political arena. I felt about the name of George Dunn, who was the former president and the longest serving president of the Cook County Board asked me to seriously consider running for public office, and I agreed to do so. And so I served six years as the Cook County, as the Secretary of State, and uh, six years as the Cook County Recorder of Deeds, and then 22 and a half years as the Secretary of State. I'm the longest serving Secretary of State in the history of the state of Illinois. You know, uh, if you heard all that, it's a great um, thumbnail sketch and bio of Jesse White, but he skimmed over something. In the beginning, he said, Dr. King was my minister. Hmm. Oh, we're going to go rewind back to that, okay? <laughs> and I want to ask you about your memories, your impressions of Dr. King. Well, Ralph Abernathy, a civil rights leader, asked me, or asked 12 of us, we were scrollers, pledges for the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity to attend Dr. King's church because he was fresh from Atlanta, Georgia, in Montgomery, Alabama. And while we were attending his church, Rosa Parks, a civil rights individual, uh, was arrested because she sat in the wrong part of the bus. And he said at church, Rosa Parks, a domestic worker, was arrested to the wrong part of the bus, and I'm gonna lead the effort to desegregate the Montgomery Transit System. I'm gonna use the nonviolent means approach. He says, I'm a follower of Gandhi, and Gandhi was instrumental in bringing about the uh, independence for the British, uh, from, from the British, for the Indians, and um, I, I want you to understand that no violence should ever be a part of this effort. And so as it turned out, I played basketball, the varsity basketball team, and uh, he used to come to all of the basketball games. He used to wait for me after every game and he would uh, give me $20. $20 was legal then, not legal now. And so, uh, based on my relationship with him, we were able to 
desegregate the Montgomery Transit System, and uh, th the rest is history. Well, uh, there's a lot that you packed in there. And um, did you want to play Major League Baseball? Did you think you had a chance to? I, I wanted to because out of the 300 ball players, there were only five that took, was offered a contract. I should back up a little bit because I had left out something. After I had signed the contract to play baseball for the Cubs, I got a notice from Uncle Sam who indicated that he wanted me to serve in the military. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to spring training, I ended up going to basic training at Fort Underwood, Missouri. And while I was there, I remembered I had to go back to Alabama State so I could walk across the stage and get my degree. And so um, I was to fly from Maxwell Air Force Base to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, then fly down to uh, Scott Air Force Base in Illinois to get back to my base. Well, as it turned out, when the plane took off, and this is my first time on an airplane, took off from uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, an unbelievable storm erupted. And so I saw some chutes in the plane, and I asked the sergeant, could I use one of those chutes in order to get out of this plane? He says, well, are you serious about jumping out of this airplane? I said, it's the first time I've been on an airplane and I'm not gonna go down with it. Mm. And so I said, what about you? He says, I'm not, I'm gonna ride the plane in. I said, let me have the chute. So I put the chute on and as it turned out, the captain said, we're gonna move from Nashville over to Memphis and we'll go around Memphis and end up at, they know higher where Wright Patterson Air Force Base is located. And as it turned out, the plane was successful in landing. Then I asked the captain, was, where's the bus station? So I took the bus back to my base. And then one day I'm walking down the, the pathway and I see this gentleman with a tailor-made uniform, spit hand boots. I say, sir, how can a person like me become a part of this unit that you're part of? He said, this is the 101st Airborne Division and uh, you, what do you have to offer? I said, well, I'm a college grad. He says, well, that's not enough. I said, well, I'm a professional baseball player. He says, you gotta be kidding me. He says, prove to me that you're a professional baseball player. I said, you wait right here. I ran to my barrack, went into my duffel bag, came out with my contract and showed it to him. And he jumped 10 feet. He says, Lieutenant Flynn would love to have you when you arrive at Fort Campbell. Well, as it turned out, when I arrived there, I went through jump school, did 35 jumps. So baseball actually was the ticket mm. for the military thing. Now, what, I have to ask you, what year were you in the Cubs farm system? Do you remember that at 1957, all? 1957. 1957. Actually, 59. 1959. 59. So this was just shortly after Ernie Banks and Gene Baker became the first African-Americans ever to play for the Cubs. Well, at, in, spring, in spring training, we would meet with him, with, with the two of them, on a regular basis, and they would tell us about life as a professional baseball player. What did they say? Well, they told you to keep your nose clean, be where you're supposed to be, do what you're supposed to do, always be a gentleman first, let the rest be debatable, never ever dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color. That's the ugliest card in the deck. Don't ever play that one. And I remember that quite well. And so. I attended Ernie's funeral at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago, and it was a sad moment for me. But I'm just glad we had a chance to meet. But interesting how, now why we, Why did you want to join the 101st? What? Because I was on this plane for the first time, and I was going to jump, and I did not have the skills to do so. And so by being a part of a this 101st Airborne Division, they teach you how to exit the aircraft, and I thought that it would be my safety net. Was that the scariest time, moment you ever had? Everyone on the plane was white, <laughs> including me. <laughs> <laughs> to let you know how scared I was. <laughs> I get it, so you were scared, that was it. Um, so now you went into the military, and tell me what that experience was like, because basically, it's, it's just being on a team, just like you were, and, and everyone we have talked to, it's all about team also, Yeah, but, but the, not individual. The unit I was with was probably one of the toughest units you'll ever find anywhere. If your mother were to walk into the door, the lieutenant said shoot, you'd shoot your mother to be 
very honest with you about how tough this unit was. And then, of course, uh, Vice President Nixon was being spat upon in Caracas, Venezuela, and stoned. And my unit with nine aircraft was asked to fly to Caracas, Venezuela to quell the unrest. We got over the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, the lieutenant said that we had been told to return to our base because the 1st Marine Division had landed in Caracas and had quelled the unrest. And he says, I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. Said, well, what's the good news, Lieutenant? The good news is we have to return to Fort Campbell and we're gonna have a night jump at your motor drop zone in, at Fort Campbell. Well, we had never jumped at night and we had more equipment on us than we had ever had before. And so as it turned out with the nine aircraft with 36 jumpers on each aircraft, we had a successful uh, drop at Fort Campbell. You're out of the service now. Bring us to that point. Well, uh, I taught school during the day, worked for the park district at night, was asked to put on the gym show, and from the one gym show in December 1959, was the beginning of the Jesse White Tumlin team. Uh, we have uh, had 18,000 young people to come through the program, and uh, we have, uh, uh, we're proud of the fact that a lot of these young people have become better educated and better informed because we require that they attend school every day and obtain good grades. The grades fall below par, they have to attend our tutoring program, cannot perform with us. We travel all over the world, Zagreb, Croatia, Belize, Israel, China, Tokyo, Japan, Hong Kong, Honolulu, Hawaii, Honolulu, the list goes on, and NBA, NFL, the list goes on and on. We, we're proud of the fact that these young people understand that they have to be in school on time every day and have one aim in mind and has to get the best education possible. Put something between their ears every day other than scalp. We're talking about knowledge and that will carry them far. We teach them to love their fellow man and woman and never ever dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color. It's called tough love. Bill, uh, a, a great lesson in, uh, in discipline and uh, you know the tumblers have been a great symbol and a, and a, and a great contribution by Jesse to uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, yes, they have. How did you get the idea to come up with the tumblers? Well, I, I did a little, I worked for the park district after school, mm -hmm. and uh, I was asked to put on the gym show by my park supervisor. The gym show was so successful that the parents asked me to continue with the program. And I mm -hmm. said, well, I was asked to put on the gym show, I did it, it turned out great, and that's it. Well, he said, well, my kids enjoy coming to the park, being with you, and listening to your spoken words. And uh, parents have thought as to what their life would be without you. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'll try one more, go one more year, and one more year. And so right now, 61 years later, we've had over 18,000 young people to come through the program. And uh, when it comes to their schooling, they have to be in school on time every day and have one aim in mind. Mm -hmm. That's to get the best education possible. We also teach our young people to love their fellow man and woman. Mm -hmm. We also want them to understand that they have to be leafless, smokeless, and pipeless. The only time they can practice pharmacy is after they're in the white coat. You know what I'm talking about, no oh, drugs. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Secretary of State, I would like to ask you, since you've been Secretary of State of, uh, of Illinois, you employ a number of folks uh, that you have working up under you. My question to you is, how do you manage to build such a dynamic team? The Tumbling Team? Oh, you're talking about the Secretary of State's office. It's the largest office of its kind in the United States. Yes. We have 4,000 employees, a $396 million budget, 130 offices, 5,000 libraries, and of course, you, we want to make sure that when you come to the Secretary of State's office, you don't have to bring your double bag, sleeping bag, or your lunch bag. Right. We want to get you in and out in a timely manner. And we want to teach, treat you in a highly professional manner. Because everyone that I've heard that goes to the Secretary of State office, they have nothing but compliments for your staff, for you, and for the way you just run that business. My question to you now is, You've been in the office over 20 years. 22 and a half years to be exact. 22 and a half years. How has technology affected the office? Well, it has helped us to speed forth the delivery of services to the people in a timely manner. And uh, we're just proud of the fact that 
when you come to the Secretary of State's office, uh, you're no longer treated in a disrespectful manner, and you treat and you are in and out in a timely way. And so we believe in treating people, our customers, the way we want to be treated. You have a book. What is the name of your book? They call Heroes Mister. And what happened was the author of the book was with me, and I was walking through the Cabrini Green area. Mm -hmm. And uh, these three gangbangers said, how are you doing, Mr. White? I said, I'm doing fine. How about you guys? Mm -hmm. I'm doing great. I said, don't forget, we're counting on you to be the best that you could be. In life, we always want you to look up. Mm -hmm. The only time we want you to look down is to tie your shoes. Mm -hmm. I don't want any gangbanging activities in this neighborhood. Do you understand? OK, Mr. White. And so the gentleman said, who are those fellows? I said, those are the three of the toughest gangbangers you'll ever find anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they called you mister? I said, well, yes, they, they did. And so he decided to entitle a book. And, 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 he was mister. and how are you doing with your, um, with your donor program? I run one of the largest organ and tissue donor programs in the United States. We ask that when you're alive and well, give blood, when you're no longer here, give organs, and when you've done those two things, we made a positive impact on society, considering the fact that one person can provide life or improve the quality of life for 25 individuals. Mm -hmm. You may not have a need today, you may not have a need tomorrow, but sometime during your lifetime, you or someone that you may know will have a need for an organ, and when that moment arrives, we would hope that um, there'll be an adequate supply of organs available. Uh, my sister passed away a couple of years ago. She was in dire need of a kidney. There was not a kidney available to her. Mm -hmm. So for the past, for the next two years, she suffered. And as it turned out, a gentleman passed away and she received his organs, mm -hmm. his, his kidneys. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of this gentleman's generosity, she lived an additional 28 years. So there's a lot to be said about the organ yes. tissue donor program. Yes. yes, yes, And I would hope that when you come into the Secretary of State's office, you would consider becoming a part of the organ tissue donor program. Well, Secretary of State, we want to thank you. Illinois loves you. And we're so happy to have you as our Secretary of State. Well, I, I'm glad to be on, on board. I, Excellent. I've lived a wonderful life because of individuals like you and Dick passed my way mm -hmm. and uh, I just want you to know that your efforts and your friendship has not gone unnoticed. As they'd say, the neighborhood, we work together, wonderful yeah. things happen. Before we let you go, uh, Jesse, I wanted to ask you about traffic safety and the, the fact that it's become a forefront for you in your position. Well, my mission is to make sure that the roads of Illinois are the safest ever. And every day we work toward that end. Uh, there are times when an individual will get a ticket and somehow we have to make sure this un individual will undergo retraining. <laughs> we want uh, to make sure that we put qualified young people on our roads and that's why we have uh, these young people at age 16, 17 who are now receiving their driver's license but at the same time, a lot of these young people are signing up to become a part of the organ and tissue donor program. And we've had somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 1,300,000 young people, 16 and 17 year olds, here in Illinois have signed up to become a part of the organ and tissue donor program. And the last thing I wanted to ask you was about, uh, no one has a totally smooth ride throughout their lives and their careers. And you've been involved in so many things. Tell us about things that may have not gone the way you wanted and your reaction to it and how you handled it. Well, one of the things was after I had signed a contract to play baseball for the Cubs, I was prepared to go to spring training. Four days before spring training, I was drafted and sent to the Army, and I thought that that was a non-starter. Um, my life has been... Rosie, I've enjoyed doing what I want to do. I've helped my community. I love my fellow man and woman. And I remind these young people that they have to be in school on time every day and put some between their ears every day other than scalp. And every year we donate uh, 17,500 hams and turkeys to needy families and senior citizens. And every summer we have what is called a trunk party where we donate 
a trunk load of school supplies for a young person who's going off to college. Right. With the tumblers, we give uh, them between $3,000 to $8,000 toward the education. We want to assist them in getting from point A to point B because one day they're going to help run this great country of ours and it's important for us to assist them in the process. So whatever the problem is, the young people will come to me to share with me and I've done all I could to improve their quality of life. What a life indeed for Jesse White. Uh, great military experience was in the Cubs farm system. Who wouldn't want to do that? And of course, the longest tenured Secretary of State of Illinois. And uh, this is the last time he's going to be in that. Now he's going to enjoy whatever's going to come after that time. Thank you very much, Jesse, for being with us. Thank you. Well, this, I'm going to continue to work with my young people. Right. <laughs> thank you, Secretary of State. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you. Job. Hey, salt and pepper's good season. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.